Hello and welcome to this episode of our Rhinoplasty for Residents and the Foundations of Facial Plastic Surgery webinar series. We really hope you have a great time watching this show. So after that tour de force, my disclosure for this short talk is that I'm not a surgeon and that I do not inject noses. Um, I do, however, have a very keen interest in safety and prevention, and as a fully board certified mother, skateboard, wakeboard, skimboard, surfboard, and kiteboard, that kite halfway up the mountain is actually my youngest son. I have more than two decades of experience in trying to prevent problems before they arise, both at home and in the practice. The other factor that is very important to me is method and structure. And this is part of the reason that the 10 point plan was published about 18 months ago. It basically embodies a logical systematic way of thinking, which should be ingrained for any injector, never mind whether they are a novice or experienced. And the 10 factors are divided into those pertaining to the patient, the product, and also the procedure. So for the next 30 minutes, I've divided the talk into two parts. Firstly, short discussion of three of these factors. And second part, treatment algorithms of some commonly encountered problems. So the first point actually will take the longest because it's important. And it's important enough for us to have had published this consensus paper about two years ago on the importance of choosing our patients carefully and thereby preventing problems. And the publication is useful in that it divides the um, conditions into those that are total contraindication to injections, those that require our discretion and those that are fine. And many of the conditions requiring discretion are about pre-treating certain conditions and about timing our procedure wisely. And for the rest, this is actually about three things, about a barrier, about bugs, and about immunity. Our skin has an amazing barrier function, which is one of the main reasons that terrestrial life is possible. And other than keeping us all from evaporating, it also prevents bad things from entering our bodies. And the thing is, after conditions such as dermatitis, this barrier can be disrupted for more than three weeks after apparent clearing, allowing pathogens to enter. And when they do, pathogens can bind to the toe-like receptors on the cytoplasmic membrane or to the node-like receptors in the cytosol. And these two things lead to an immune or inflammatory response that can cause late onset nodules more than a year later. And this underlines the incredible importance of timing our procedures accurately. The thing is that bugs don't only come in via the skin, they can also be from systemic origin because systemic disease can also bind to the toe-like receptors um, in our body. And we should ask our patients whether they are on antibiotics and if so, what the reason would be. So absolute contraindications to fillers, cutaneous wires, are conditions that live on and near the nose. Things like acne, rosacea, dermatitis, especially seborrheic dermatitis, and infective conditions such as impetigo and herpes simplex virus. And systemically, dental caries, a bladder infection, gastro, autoimmune disease, these conditions can all lead to late onset adverse effects. And we need to understand this. The fact is that 10% of the world's population has acne. Fact. Another fact is that Propionia bacterium acne is present in all the stages of acne, from closed comedones to pustules. And the next fact is that P. acnes are immunostimulatory, and if their niche becomes disturbed by things like fillers, they can lead to biofilms. Another fact is that we do not know the safe injection distance from an active lesion. So there's nothing telling us that a patient with acne on the chin is safe to inject in the malar area. We also know that at the edge of a topically treated lesion, there's increased incidence of resistant B acne. So we should pre-treat our patients adequately. 
the number one treatment worldwide topically is a combination of adapalene and benzoyl peroxide. And three weeks of treatment will lead to a 70% reduction in resistant P acnes. So there's no reason why we shouldn't be treating our patients with acne upfront. We need to remember that conditions such as herpes simplex are infective until the last crust has gone. And patients with a history of herpes simplex should be treated prophylactically from one day before the procedure for the full five days, because what we're trying to prevent is this thing. Herpes simplex likes to spread in areas of injury. And if this happens, the patient will have this condition every single time they have a herpes simplex outbreak. Conditions such as impetigo can cause major problems. And if they are staph carriers, it's so easy just to treat prophylactically by using mepirocin twice a day for five days and repeated six monthly will reduce staph carrier status considerably. And inflammatory skin conditions should be treated adequately before we inject fillers. And this takes time. To get control of rosacea where the barrier function is severely impeded takes 12 weeks. Perioral dermatitis takes six weeks to clear. And after apparent clearing of eczema, the barrier is disrupted for three to four weeks post-clearance. So we should treat, wait a month, and then do the fillers. Obviously, active autoimmunity is an absolute contraindication to fillers. But patients with chronic urticaria, multiple severe allergies or a history of anaphylaxis are also bad candidates because this tells us something about the genetic makeup. And it's known that a certain genetic makeup plus a bacterial stimulus are the real causes of late onset problems and granulomatous reactions. And it's interesting to think about this condition called the Asia syndrome, autoimmune and inflammatory syndrome induced by adjuvants because this is caused in patients with a specific HLI phenotype. After multiple immunological hits, which we will discuss now, and it develops late, it can be years later, and initially there are local manifestations which can also become systemic autoimmune disease. And the hits are, interestingly, local trauma, any infection, dental amalgams, fillers, vaccinations, menstrual exacerbations. We know that HA can also be um, causative. It can be an antigen, a super antigen, or be an adjuvant. But the big problem would be bacteria because they bind to the toe-like receptors that cause inflammation, immunity, and also autoimmunity. So think of a patient who tells you that every time they get gastro, all the fillers in their face flare up. Think of Asia syndrome. Also, people with multiple menstrual flares during the cycle, think of Asia syndrome. So second point, reversibility. We are absolutely blessed to be working with a product that we can actually erase. But it amazes me often when doing workshops how seldom colleagues actually know how to dilute and to, and to dose and understand the differential effects of different products on the different Hironiotase um, HA products. Also, that we actually need to massage after using HAs. We need to buy from a good supplier, understand that there are ovine, bovine, and human recombinant ones. Not all are available in all countries. And we must make quite sure that the expiry date is good. So just seven practical aspects regarding Hironiotase. The first is, we need informed consent because using it to reverse a filler is off-label use. And we actually need to obtain this consent upfront when we consent for the procedure. Secondly, we dilute with water or with saline or bacteriostatic saline. There is little evidence to show that lignocaine is of any use. In fact, it might even be bad because the increased diffusion may give side effects. And for the 1,500 unit vials we find in our country, you can dilute with one to 10 moles of diluent and then use according to the need. It works immediately. The tea half is two minutes and the duration normally 48 hours. So you can assess after two days, most injectors will, if it's not for an urgent indication, treat weekly. The normal dose for nodules varies according to the type of HA you're using and the type of HAs, but 
said to be between 4 and 40 units per 0.1 mil of HA, and then to reassess at 48 hours. If it's a vascular problem, obviously we use high dose, we'll discuss this. Um, if it is an inflammatory nodule we are treating, most injectors would actually pre-treat with antibiotic for two days to two weeks beforehand, because you are basically by dissolving the nodule, setting bacterial pathogens free into the um, circulation. And if it's very inflammatory, some injectors might also pre-treat with steroids. It's important to massage after use of HAs, and especially when treating vascular complications, to perhaps use a cannula because the bruising induced by a needle may complicate the clinical picture. Then just seven points regarding safety. There can be reactions, but local reactions are not common, 0 0.05 to 0.69%. The common ones being edema, erythema, pain, itching, and bruising. This picture um, resolved within an hour. Urticaria and angioedema are also possible, less than 0.1%. All of us know people who report anaphylaxis, but this is really rare. I really hunted for an incidence and couldn't find a discrete one. It's rare, but possible. Patients with a wasp or bee sting allergy might be a relative contraindication if one has the time to consider it so. Interestingly, Aronidase may interfere with certain drugs, so take a good medical history. And certain drugs may interfere with the action of Aronidase, and commonly used ones like anti-inflammatories, antihistamines, and commonly used antioxidants. If you do want to test, the normal dose is four to eight units. Some publications say more than 20 units. And you wait 30 minutes by which time for a positive reaction, there must be a positive wheel and flare, which is defined as an eight millimeter lesion at the injection site. And most publications will suggest that um, any patient who has been given HAs be observed for 60 minutes afterwards. Most of the publications are done with in vivo tests. And I found this one by Gabriela Casabona wonderful because she actually took a patient who was due for abdominoplasty and she tested five different HA products with five different HAs products and found that there was in fact a threefold difference in number of units that you needed per volume of HA and that it's critically important that we understand the products available on our market and the effects on the HA products in our hands. So what she did was to do 0 0.1 and 0 0.2 mil aliquots and then inject every two minutes with four units of the five different kinds of HAs. And she found that the time to dissolve actually varied from under two to more than 16 minutes. And then one month later, she took two volumizers and took 0 0.1 mil aliquots of each and injected higher doses of HAs. And they looked at the skin reactions um, at zero point in 24 hours and found that at the higher doses, there was a far higher chance of inflammatory and type 1 reactions. Obviously, HAs has an influence on our endogenous body hyaluronidase, hyaluronic acid. And this happens at the higher doses. So above 300 doses, our natural HA in the skin gets degraded. Patients often ask us this, will it not melt away my normal stores of HA? But it only lasts for 48 hours and then the production basically writes itself again. So the third point, injection anatomy. During surgery, the nerves are the important part. Injection anatomy basically is often vascular. We need to understand safety by depth because we're injecting blind and understand all the anastomosis that Dario mentioned so beautifully. But there's a very interesting functional component in the form of functional angiosomes. The fact is there are no end arteries in the skin. Functionally, there are multiple units, 3D units, fed by a central feeder artery and basically have a periphery of anastomoses, which can either be true anastomoses or things called choke anastomoses, which can close off partially or completely. So on the arterial side, it's a big 3D vascular freeway consisting of freeways, checkpoints, and roadblocks depending on whether the anastomoses are true anastomoses or choke anastomoses. 
So when a bolus of HA lands up in a vessel, it is an extremely inflammatory incident, although the rest of the skin copes very well with HA. If there are true anastomosis, the bolus may spread distally. If there are choke anastomosis, the spread is restricted. And if the choke anastomosis close off completely in areas such as the forehead or glabella where there are very few valves, there can be retrograde spread so that the filler ends up in the ophthalmic circulation, the cavernous sinus, and also the brain. So this is an example of intra-arterial HA with a severe inflammatory response. The lower picture, one can see an HA bolus in a vein. And very clearly, this bolus is far larger than any um, red blood corpuscle, which means it sidestepped the capillary circulation to land in the venous circulation. And this is an example of a choke anastomosis with a lead oxide picture in one of Taylor and Ashton's cadaver studies. But never mind where on the face the intravascular incident is, the problem lands up in five clinical areas. And these are decided due to anastomosis, um, angiosomes between the ophthalmic and facial and adjacent maxillary and also superficial temporal angiosomes. So here are the five areas, the glabella, the dorsal nose, the nasal tip, across the central lips, and also the cheek. And this is why we should be checking very carefully whenever we inject anywhere on the face for fleeting ischemia in the glabella and at the nasal tip. So choke anastomosis define the boundary of necrosis. True anastomosis will provide a freeway. And this is because this is why the use of nitroglycerin is now being frowned upon because it can basically propagate the embolus and increase the number of angiosomes. So these are the choke angiosomes, five normal areas. But there are also true angiosomes, and there are three normal areas for this, the one being between the angular and the dorsal nasal or supratrochlear vessels, the second, the nasal tip, and the third across the lips, both upper and lower lips. And because these are true vascular highways, this kind of situation can arise where filler into the facial artery on the one side of the face can run all the way across to cause this. Now, some algorithms for diagnosis and treatment. One important aspect, when we consent our patients for the procedure, we are by law now obliged to consent them to the treatment of a complication. There are increasing litigation cases overseas where bad outcomes are followed because a patient in the, the um, acute moment did not want to consent to treating a complication. A new kid on the block in helping us is actually ultrasound, which can help us to see where previous fillers have been placed, to map vessels, and to guide injection of higher layers. I'll show you an example in a minute. Sona can also help us to identify the nature of previous fillers. This is going to become one of the big things in complication management in the next few years. So we'll quickly discuss five different algorithms for treatment. What is important is that we take a very good history always from our patients. And if patients get referred to us to make quite sure that we know exactly what happened around the time of injection. You'll see many of these um, slides have a little camera at the top. When the lower one appears, it's at the end of the algorithm. I'm absolutely happy for you to photograph these slides. Firstly, early onset events. We all know how to treat these. So often hypersensitivity reactions. My big plea is make sure that your practice has sufficient amounts of the products you need, adrenaline, hyaluronidase, that you know how to use it, that there are practice protocols in place that they get practiced, and that all the drugs that are needed for emergency medicine are not past the expiry date. In our practice, we actually have um, computer prompts with the dates of all the emergency drugs. So not all early complications are immediate reactions. This was a horrifying case which developed two days after a um, workshop done by a very, very thorough physician. 
where within one week, this picture developed. And this is an example of a sterile abscess, which may develop early or late. Um, in these patients, one needs to do microscopy and culture, which is often negative. And if possible to do fluorescent inside a hybridization to get the genes of the bug, they need antibiotics, they need urgent incision, incision and drainage. Now, skin discoloration, this is an avatar from Dario in my sort of in our book, where you can see how all the different conditions have been superimposed on one avatar face. And here you can see the classical distribution of the vascular lesion, but there are many reasons for discoloration, hematoma, ecchymosis, new vascularization, hyperpigmentation, down to ischemia. So skin discoloration, it might be an um, hematoma, ecchymosis. In the early phase, compress. In the later phase, one might use heparin, vitamin K, ointment, or laser. I'll show you the settings in a minute. New vascularization might be due to tissue trauma. It could be due to angiogenesis by HA breakdown products. It could be due to increased tissue pressure due to superficial injections. And often this will clear in three to 12 months. If not, one could use laser. Hyperpigmentation, we all know how to treat. Hydroquinone, retinoids, if necessary, laser. The Tyndall effect can be treated in various ways, depending on where the product lies. In the upper picture, injected. In the low one, because the lesions are so superficial, Puncturing and expressing is adequate. Ischemia will obviously be treated according to the normal vascular algorithms. This is a patient referred to as 24 hours post filler, treated with the following settings. And this is her 72 hours post pulse dye laser. This is a, a very, very useful um, service to offer our patients. Now swelling. One knows that procedural swelling will peak at 48 hours post-treatment, but there are multiple other reasons. If we go by time, post-interventional, within hours, often non-inflammatory. Mailer edema will start within days to months, especially after certain treatment areas in the face. Immediate reactions within minutes to hours. Classically, there's pruritus, and one needs to look out to make sure that isn't perhaps a two-phased and more serious response. Type 4 reactions, allergic reactions, often after days, and can present with induration, edema, erythema, or nodules. Acute infection can present early, as we saw, or late. And then the late inflammatory response syndrome or late onset nodules often start after three to four weeks, can be persistent and very difficult to get rid of. Then there's this interesting concept of persistent intermittent delayed swelling, which was described by Adad Almeida and a group, where they found intermittent swelling on a regular basis due to HA in the skin. And this clears well when reversed with hyaluronidase. This is Ada herself treating the condition with 0.1 mil and basically reduction in the problem by one hour and no recurrence. Edema may be difficult to treat, and one goes by time of onset. If it's within minutes, is it itching or not? If it's not, it might be post-interventional. If it is, it might be a type 1 allergy. There might be a second phase reaction. We might need to reverse or treat systemically. Within days, if it's typical male edema, it may subside. If not, we might need to reverse. If it's late, we need to exclude infection. And if it's very late, it might be the late inflammatory response syndrome or late onset nodules. And we'll go through some algorithms for late onset nodules in a minute. This is complicated. It's a busy slide. You're welcome to photograph it because it's something one refers back to. But the um, reference given at the bottom, the Snozi and Panlocham publication is a good one to read in this regard. So this patient was referred to me um, four days after treatment in a workshop by um, a well-known injector with severe periorbital edema. Um, she was a patient new to me, but when I examined her, I saw this lesion in the hairline, which was secretorial alopecia. Biopsy um, was positive um, for LE. She was ANF positive. And just a um, memory jolt to remember that we are still physicians and that periorbital edema actually has 
a differential diagnosis. It might be inflammatory or allergic, but it could be renal, cardiac, thyroid, autoimmune disease like LE. It might also be previous fillers. Now, vascular reactions are the feared ones, and they might present with early blanching, lividoid discoloration, what Greg Goodman always calls, um, calls fishneck stocking appearance. There might be pustulation due to tissue necrosis. Once again, look at the typical distribution on the forehead. Intravascular filler is an extremely noxious insult. And even when landing in a vein, there will be temporary um, constriction so that blanching is seen also with venous intravenous um, incidence, and we need to be cognizant of this. An example of blanching, patient of Greg Goodman's, but this was with local anesthetic. And then the typical reticular fishnet stocking pattern of vascular occlusion and the pustulation. And a very important point here is that any pustulation if within one week after filler is not herpes simplex, it is vascular occlusion until proven otherwise. This is a typical example of vascular occlusion done before the HDPH era. And you can see the extra bruising because HAs was in, in injected here with the needle. The new way of going is HDPH, where we go by capillary refill time. The dose is based on tissue volume. It's given hourly, and there's normally complete resolution. If it's one facial area, 500 units hourly until resolution, two facial areas, 1,000 units, and three units, 1,500 units hourly until remission. And the important point, it should be massaged because the HAs get diluted, it gets deactivated, and it diffuses away. Now, this is actually an amazing case given to me by Stefania Roberts in Australia, showing the use of ultrasound. This patient was injected on a Friday. By the Sunday, she started complaining of pain and discoloration. And Stefania saw on the Monday. And while on a WhatsApp call with Leonie Schelke in Holland, they talked her through the treatment. Um, she had vascular compromise also of the um, mucosal aspect of the lower lip. Here we can see the sonar showing turbulent flow and then total obstruction in the green box. Here is a needle being introduced with the HAs being injected and within a minute flow restarting and laminar flow, normal flow, no more turbulence. And within six minutes on this video, which is too long to play now, improvement of the picture. So ultrasound can be a very, very useful adjunct and help us to, in fact, inject far lower doses than suggested in HDPH if one places it accurately. The ophthalmic complications are the feared ones, and this is why we must have an ophthalmologist or retinal specialist on speed dial if we do regular fillers. This um, systematic review published by um, Vandana Chatwood discussed 190 cases, most of them with autologous fat, and they said that the HA fillers had a better outcome the entire face was involved you know, in the study, although the glabella was the most frequent site. So end of last year, a few of us published this systematic review looking at only HA, 26 articles, 44 cases. And interestingly, the vision loss occurred only from upper facial injection. And 32 of the 44 cases actually were after injection of the nose glabella area. Um, the visual loss was immediate with volumes as low as 0.2 mil. And what's important, certain patterns had a worse prognosis than others. If the central retinal artery or the ophthalmic artery was injected, the prognosis was bad. If it was a branch retinal artery occlusion, prognosis was better. Um, we know that the glabella injections are more prone to central retinal artery occlusion, while nose injections are more prone to ophthalmic artery occlusion. Whichever way, we must have a retinal center on speed dial. If something happens, we should check the vision, know how to do it and to document, because some of the criticism against previous publications was that they claim improvement of vision, but the vision wasn't checked up front. We must test the pupillary reflex. We need to decompress, and this can be done by simple things like using apoclonidine drops or timolol drops every 15 minutes, having the patient rebreathe in a brown paper bag, and then use HAs if you are proficient in doing this. By this time, the patient should have been referred to a retinal center. Um, a good question being asked 
is whether establishing flow is enough. And this is actually a study done by one of our colleagues, Hamzak Mustak, from the, when he was at the Shine Eye Institute, where they consciously blocked the retinal artery in rabbits and then gave within 30 minutes um, under lab conditions sufficient retrobulbar HAs and then did retinal studies. And in these rabbits, just re-establishing flow was not enough. So a lot of work still needs to be done in this regard. Then late onset adverse events, which are often the niggly ones. They can have various presentations. Um, and there are many approaches to this. This is a very recent publication where we have sort of defined them as occurring after two weeks. You need to decide whether they're inflammatory or not. Good history and examination is very important. But the one thing that struck me from this ad board was the really global differences in um, approaching these events. The Americans um, believe in using steroids up front. Many of the others believe in antibiotics. If early um, events are non-inflammatory, they might just be non-implant nodules as these. Um, they might be benign, they might be recalcitrant. So normal practice is to give two weeks of an antibiotic. We'll discuss that in a minute. If they don't resolve, never forget the um, value of a biopsy because conditions such as atypical mycobacteria and sarcoidosis might be proven. Um, in India last year, I was fascinated to see three cases of atypical mycobacteria, which are developed after cleaning the face and also hands with non-sterile tap water. Late onset nodules might have different presentations. So swelling or intermittent swelling, in duration, and nodules, all part of the same spectrum. And these problems can often be prevented by good patient selection and a really careful aseptic non-touch technique. So when we see these nodules, decide whether they're implant nodules, whether they're infectious. If they are not inflammatory, do they bother the patient or not? If not, you can leave them. If they bother you, high lays. If they don't go, high lays again. If they don't go, one can use a cocktail of five if you with trimsin alone. If they are inflammatory, what is the degree? Is it mildly inflammatory or is it basically a fluctuant abscess? Um, for mild inflammation, we can give antihistamines, non-steroidals, maybe antibiotics. For intense inflammation, antibiotics, one might want to reverse if it's fluctuant or a frank abscess incision and drainage. At any stage, 5-FU intralesional steroids might be used, but just be careful of steroid um, immunosuppression, rebound, and worsening of biofilm or infection. And um, there definitely is a very distinct regional variation in the treatment. Never forget the value of a biopsy. So this is an example of a nodule in the upper lip. Um, one hour before and one hour after um, injection with high lays by Ada Almeida. The patient was pre-treated for a week with antibiotics. This is a more recalcitrant lump, which needed two treatments for resolution. In um, Sao Paulo, in, in Brazil, they use a bovine HAs. The one in South Africa we have is an ovine one. And when we use antibiotics, it's important to use antibiotic stewardship for skin. We can use certain ones for sinusitis, certain ones, for dental problems, certain ones, for GIT. There's one place we might use hypofloxacin. One does know it now has a black box warning, and we cannot use the normal four to six weeks of cyprofloxacin that we used in the past. For any low-grade infection, cyclodox remains an example, uh, an, um, a possibility. An interesting treatment might be with the gout drugs, because the inflammatory pathway has two legs, a cyclooxygenase and a lipoxygenase pathway. Here we'd use the normal non-steroidals, and here we can use colchicine, which helps for some patients. There are certain guidelines. These are the normal diagnostic um, doses used um, routinely. And this is a patient where four weeks of ciprofloxacin did not work, and where four weeks of colchicine actually resolved the problem. Most of the late inflammatory um, nodules that I get referred to me are because patients had dental work in the period um, close to doing the filler. This lady had a dental procedure two weeks before she was treated elsewhere. But we must remember to always take a good history. 
This patient had fillers 10 years before and quite by chance complained of onset, um, recent onset of dyspnea, and this was actually a case of sarcoidosis. And this was a previous um, a interesting publication I saw recently, a woman who had fillers 20 years previously, 10 years later, a renal transplant, and 10 years after that, developed multiple nodules. And she presented for cosmetic rhinoplasty, and on the um, scans, they saw these multiple lesions, which proved to be mononuclear cells with multi-vacuolated materials, just to prove that immunosuppression does funny things to fillers we should always be aware. So to conclude, um, we should have a systematic way of approaching all our patients. We've discussed just three of these aspects. We should have algorithms for treating problems should they occur, and understand that planning our procedure optimally can prevent many of the less acute problems. If this is the time of filler, dental work should be spaced two to four weeks before or after the filler treatment. Microdome abrasions, chemical peels at least two weeks before or after. And routine surgery and vaccinations actually should be spaced three months before or after the filler. Patients shouldn't be ill when we inject them. We should furnish them with written, clear, pre and post instructions. Which brings us to one last thing and the elephant in the room. What now of the times of COVID? Should we, we be injecting or not? The big thing is, Nobody knows. What we do know is that viruses can cause late onset adverse effect, effects. Um, currently, there is no increased incidence worldwide, which in a way is worrying, because we do know that when exposed to a virus for the first time, we don't have an immune response. We develop one. And then our T cells start with our cell-mediated immunity our B cell starts making antibodies. We've got um, natural killer cells, macrophages, lymphokines, and cytokines. So these are the things that will make us respond to possibly a second wave of the same virus. So whether this will happen or not, nobody knows. But I think there are certain questions we should answer for ourselves wherever we are in the world. And this will help us decide when we are ready to start doing fillers in our own practice. Things we should ask is, is our clinic currently functioning optimally? We, for instance, are working in two non-contact teams. I don't have an assistant. We're working with limited staff. Can our um, photography staff isn't there? Can we work optimally? Secondly, should something go wrong, is our normal retinal support system functional? In our country, no. Is the hospital support when the virus is active? Possibly not. Are we willing to consent our patients to a risk of increased late onset nodules, um, knowing that a viral stimulus may increase this? If they say yes, we must know that we cannot use steroids. Do we want to use long-term antibiotics? We cannot use all anti-inflammatories. If the patient has latent COVID, they are more bruisable. And lastly, if something happens to ourselves, if we are ill, is there somebody to give support? My two current support systems are both working in um, COVID units, so my normal support system is there. I think we should be able to answer these questions before we start injecting in our own practice. And learn from yesterday's mistakes. Um, be present today. And this will help us have hope for tomorrow. And that ends my song, leaving only a little bit of time for me and Dario to answer questions, never mind how mean they are. <laughs> Isolda, this is such a wonderful and typical uh, uh, talk that you've given. It makes me think uh, that most of us would probably um, have a hard time um, uh, remembering half of what you've said. So it, it really is food for thought. We all need to go and study what you've said and what has been published. So thank you very much. New things again from you. You've never given a talk um, that has it not recovered, hasn't covered something new. So thank you for that. Um, I'm going to hand over to Cam. He's going to manage the question section. Um, so Cam, it's over to you. Um, Dari, Zolda, both of you, thank you very much. Um, Zolda, are you going to stop? <laughs> Phyllis. Must I stop? <laughs> no, no, no. no, no. no. 
stop sharing your screen, please? I'm going to run through a couple of questions that have come through. Um, the first one for Doria, um, a very interesting comment from Augustine. He has, he's got a patient that is, uh, I'll just read it through for you. Um, he had the patient had rhinoplasty 10 years ago and now wants non-surgical treatment. His question is, what should I do due to the risks of performing non-surgical rhinoplasty on somebody who's had rhinoplasty before? I think that, uh, I don't know what is all that is thinking about that. I think that normally it should be a contraindication that uh, if a patient has, has done a rhinoplasty, a surgical one, but if 10 years ago the patient has done a, rhin a surgical rhinoplasty, let's be like more concrete and uh, make an examination of the nose. And if the soft tissues are more pliable and, and they, they can move very easily from the uh, surrounding tissues like from the bone and the cartilage probably even though the, the anatomy has been distorted uh, if we go down deep to the bone and cartilage perichondrium maybe we can try to expand very slowly those soft tissues and uh, treat the patient so I would recommend to inject very few quantities slow expansion and then time by time they can expand more and not like in a, a primary rhinoplasty injection, we can wait for two, three sessions and get the nose in shape that we want. Great. Um, Dario, another question this time from Filio. Um, Filio, she asks, she wants to know, how can I inject the forehead when you want to use to, sorry, can I ask you how to inject the forehead when you want to achieve this nice convexity? Do you use a cannula or needle given the vascularity in the area of the supratroch? and superorbital vessels. I had not the chance to explain that when we use the needle on the forehead, the, particularly in patients with soft uh, skin and soft tissue that are very thin, the filler can spread like creating a sun rays appearance with the needle. So it's much more precise to go in the place that we want to, uh, to get with the needle. But with the cannula, if we start from the um, insertion of the um, temporalis muscle, so a little bit further, we make a hole and we go with the 38 millimeter and 25 gauge cannula. We insert the cannula after having injected a little bit amount of the filler. We wait 10 seconds to the light again to make it second. Like, then we proceed immediately. And then from there, we inject retrograde and we do multiple tunnels and then we mold it. This is the best way to inject the forehead, in my opinion. Sometimes we have a, a void in the central part so we have to start from the midline and we go down with the camera with the same technique please disinfect very accurately because we have hair here so we don't want infection uh, okay so doria i have a question for you it was very interesting at your first talk where you you're comparing um call it liquid rhinoplasty or surgical rhinoplasty so what i need to try and understand here is how you're going to be Doing a liquid rhinoplasty and might cost the patient less and it's a quicker result, but you have to repeat that then in two years. And ultimately, you've got to kind of draw a balance between getting the surgery and doing, I don't know, it's, it's such a controversial topic. And I am so proud of you standing up kind of against what all us rhinoplasty surgeons want to do is cut. And here you come as a surgeon and you're saying, but try liquid rhinoplasty. So I'm interested yeah. to know how, how do I debate that? Yeah, I can tell you that uh, there are different ways to go to Rome. And uh, one way to bring us the patient is to treat them with a, a non-surgical rhinoplasty because they will see. First of all, we cannot treat every patient. This is the main thing. So not every nasal defect can be corrected with a non-surgical rhinoplasty. So let's say that we can treat the 30%, the 40% of the noses with non-surgical. Let's say that of these 30, 40%, like the 70% comes and get the surgery after two years because they get bored of getting injections. So the only thing that we have to do is dissolve the filler in order not to get the filler inside when we treat surgically the nose, because when we have to make grafts, like for example, the cartilage graft, we don't want any other material in the area. And uh, this is what I suggest to treat the patient that we want to uh, have a very quick result with a simple correction. Then if we want, we can go through the surgical correction because some patients, and 
very small percentage of them because when they come for a rhinoplasty, they normally are convinced that they want to change something. Uh, we can bring them to our side and let them be less uh, scared about the operation and get to the operation easily after they see the simulation. Because one thing is to show them with the Adobe Photoshop or different other uh, ways of mimicking the surgery, surgical result. One way is to show 3D correction with the filler, which is very quick for us when we learn the technique because we are surgeons and we know the anatomy. We know how to change with the special graft that we show. If we do a clavellar graft and then we do the filler, we do the exactly the same. The only thing that changes is that we don't have to smooth the graft. We have something that is 3D inside and we mold it with the figures. Of course, it's not the same, but it stays in place and can show the patient the possible result. This is what I suggest. Guys, we, we're running out of time here. Eh? I'm going to, uh, last few things. Last question here, it might be difficult to answer is, Solly would like to know, what is the patient dissatisfaction rate with liquid rhinoplasty? Do you have any experience, says Olga, because I know this, this answer. What do you think? No, I don't know, Dario. Yeah, but let's say, so if we have a complication, there will be a high rate of dissatisfaction for sure, particularly yeah. if it's a very bad complication, no? Because uh, let's skip the blindness, which we hope we will never, we'll never see. But uh, uh, there are not only in the nose injections uh, blindness, because temple, you remember, no, and there are many, many options. My dissatisfaction rate with uh, non-surgical rhinoplasty probably is 3%, 1%. Everybody is so happy. I would make the videos. It's like, have you seen some surgeons like uh, uh, now there, there are so many videos of still and Diane, which is breaking the pictures in front of the patient profile and then you show that all the patient in the picture and then you see the new nose, no? But, uh, and they do like, uh, all of us have seen some patient doing, oh wow, when they look in the mirror and they cry, they do whatever, no? This is something special because nobody, uh, no patient is aware, away from the ones, very small ones, percentage that ask for a non-surgical. When you propose and they show, and they come for the chin of the lips and the, the mailer, and they look at the nose and they say, doctor, you're right. Look at my nose. Look how it changes. And I promise you that uh, most of them will go surgical for sure. In a year or two, they will come for surgical. Okay. So guys, last two things. Firstly, I want to give a, um, a little shout out. Next Sunday, we have uh, Brian Wong speaking to us. I don't want to tell you who else is speaking yet. It's going to be a little surprise. You'll find out in the, in the rest of the week. So, Brian, we look forward to seeing you next Sunday. And before Dion says his thank yous, I'm going to ask Isolde first and then Dario after that. Isolde, what are the three most important things that you want to leave as a message tonight with the participants? Fillers remains a beautiful part of aesthetic medicine, so I'm not putting it down at all. But by selecting our patients properly, we can avoid many, many problems. Um, know your, um, have algorithms at hand, select your patients properly and understand the anatomy. Awesome. Yeah, very true. Very true. Yeah, yeah. These, things, these things I said at the beginning and at the end of the, as a tip, final tips, Knowing the anatomy, have a proper, even surgical experience to do the non-surgical rhinoplasty. Because if you know what is below, you know what to do when you inject. And uh, please select accurately the patient. Patient selection is mandatory because you cannot do everything. Sometimes you see a patient with a big arm and everybody is injecting, they get an elephant nose with, for nothing or distorted like glabellar brotip area, glabellar brotip lines, and then you have to dissolve everything. And maybe not three, but four and five, be slow, the slowest injector in the world, as Steve Liu is saying, because you can have problems. And then the expansion is much better. And aspirate, because it's all to show you that uh, there can be very severe complications, even though we don't, uh, we don't have any problem in making our techniques uh, 
available to everybody. When we teach, we have to teach this. Great, guys. I'm going to hand over to Dion to close things off. Eh? Um, thank you very much to Dario and to Isolde. Um, you have both set the bar at a very high level. Um, we've both enjoyed, we've all enjoyed your talks enormously. Um, this will be memorable. In two weeks' time, we have Hamza Mustak um, present eyelids. Um, and we're looking forward to that. Um, Hamza studied in UCLA. Um, then uh, I want to say thank you to Amir for running our show for us so expertly. Amir, without you, this would not have happened. Thank you very much. And then lastly, I would like to punt um, Isolda and Dario's book, The Facial Anatomy. Please, guys, go out and buy it. It's for a good cause. It go all the money goes to a facial burns um, unit. Um, I know how hard they worked. I looked at the avatars. It's fantastic stuff. So thank you very much, everybody. I hope to see you next week at the Rhinoplasty. Good night. Thank you.